At this time, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Gus Chakala, President and CEO of Project Assistance. Gus founded Project Assistance in 1996 with the goal of transforming our client's approach to portfolio and project management to achieve a standard of excellence in execution that consistently delivers expected project outcomes. A recognized portfolio and project management expert, Gus is a published author of many popular articles and books on the subject of project management, and he's frequently asked to present and teach topics of interest around project and portfolio management. Gus? Thank you, Jan, and good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for attending today's webinar. I'd like to start off today just by having a brief introduction uh, of the topic. So what we're going to talk about is uh, really acquiring the best talent for crucial leadership roles in a staffing environment, in a temporary staffing environment. Uh, in terms of the agenda, first we'll talk about these roles in context. I'll use a couple of examples of how these roles are typically utilized in, pro in, in project settings. Uh, we'll then move on to some of the typical challenges uh, that we see in this world, as well as the impact of those challenges. We'll follow that up with some best practices for how to meet those challenges. We'll talk about some next steps, uh, where we go from here today. And then finally, as Jan mentioned, uh, we'll save uh, questions to the end. You can enter questions in the console at any time, so if you think of something during the presentation, feel free to put it in there, and we'll uh, uh, if it's not something that requires immediate attention, we'll go ahead and address that at the end. So starting off with leadership roles and context, you'll see that each of our uh, major agenda items starts off with a quote. And what, what we like to do when we talk about this subject of, of leadership in a project-based environment is, is to really uh, put, put these leadership roles in context of what does it mean to be in to be in a mode uh, as a leader in a project delivery situation. So for example, uh, if we think about the, the major process groups in a project-based environment, at the very top of the pyramid, we have this idea of, of a portfolio of projects. So at the strategy and governance level, uh, there, there's the idea of are we working on the right projects, and there are certainly leadership roles in, in that part of the portfolio and project management world. As we get down to execution, we have a couple different kinds of leaders. There's those leaders that are responsible uh, not only at the portfolio level for saying are we working on the right projects, but are we, the question are we doing projects right is addressed at the execution level. And typically, if we think about what does right mean, right means on time, on budget, and on spec. From a, from a process group standpoint or from a context standpoint, we think about the processes that deliver on time, on budget, as being related to project management process groups. When we think about delivering something on spec, we talk about, we do, the, the term we use is life cycle management. I'll use a couple of examples on the next two slides following this slide. But this idea of, in order to deliver something on spec, we're going to build the deliverables or the output of the project. And, and there's a, a life cycle methodology uh, approach that, that's utilized in this kind of a context. And then down, then down actually in, in the actual doing the work, there can be both on time, on budget, technical execution. There's, there's sort of a technical process to project management, how we, how we build a work breakdown structure, how we link tasks, how we balance resources. It's technical in nature. Uh, it's different than the leadership components, but it's, it's more of a, a how-to. And the same is true on the on-spec delivery. So when we think about building systems or building new drugs or building new aircraft or whatever it is that this project's going to deliver, there's also the technical skills that, that, in fact, put the deliverables of the project together. So we could use an example, uh, or several examples, actually. This integrated process framework, at the very top, uh, doing the right projects is the process of planning uh, projects, uh, suggesting projects, uh, selecting the right projects based on some way to compare them to one another, measuring how things are going once execution starts, and ultimately, uh, the right projects sometimes become the wrong projects, and what would the response if we're measuring projects and they're off spec, or they're way over budget, or, or they can't meet the schedule, uh, or even other things that, that, that measure projects in the portfolio. They're not going to meet the market demand. The, the, the economics have changed. The comp competitive landscape has changed. Customers have changed. Uh, the economy has changed. All these things can impact uh, how we measure the success of projects and how we respond to those external conditions. Uh, and in some cases, even the internal conditions. 
as I mentioned already, you know, project management is about on time, on budget, or what, what I like to refer to as the business controls. So the business of the project is typically managed through project management. And now when we think about life cycle management, the examples I, I mentioned I would use is uh, things like uh, new product development for consumer products has its own methodology or life cycle management approach, uh, sometimes referred to as NPD, new product development. Uh, software development life cycle, often abbreviated as SDLC, uh, a different kind of life cycle management. Uh, the whole construction world, the AED world, architectural engineering and design, has its own methodology, has its own set of tasks. And what we're getting out of these things from a life cycle management standpoint are, are the major uh, groupings of activities that need to occur within a project. Right? So if I understand the science of software development, I understand from a leadership standpoint how we gather requirements, how we build specifications, how we develop systems, how we test systems, how we implement systems. Same thing true for consumer products, how we build prototypes, how we, how we think about commercialization scale-ups. In the uh, biopharma development world, how, uh, in this case, a U.S.-based example, how the Food and Drug Administration mandates that clinical trials be registered, how protocols are developed, how, how the uh, information is collected during clinical trials to tell us whether this drug has efficacy, what the dosing is. All those kinds of questions come from the life cycle management. And in the, uh, in this case, federal government, uh, aerospace and defense world, there's another entire set of methodologies that can be used. And, and, and the point of bringing this up is to say, we bring together as leaders the idea of, are we working on the right projects? Are we delivering on time and on budget? And are we, in fact, delivering on spec or with quality the deliverables that come out of each of those life cycles? And these, these five examples are intended to be just that, a, a sampling of, of, of the various methodologies that are available to us. For example, in the technology world, not, there's not just software development, there's, there's uh, technology infrastructure uh, uh, architecting and, and implementation, for example. So as, 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 as we look at this context, as, as we get ready to turn the corner to talk about staffing leadership roles, uh, go, going into a more specific example, if we went to the information technology world, we still have that idea of selecting the right project sitting up top, how we select, measure, respond, and react to uh, making sure we're, we're delivering the right projects. But now as we start thinking about an IT methodology for delivering on spec versus a project management methodology, we begin to see the kinds of leadership skills and roles that come out of, of, of this context. So in an information technology context, uh, especially software development lifecycle, we might see business analysts, solution architects, database analysts, they really perform key and critical leadership roles in terms of setting the project up for success and ultimately delivering that project in a successful manner. When we talk about on spec, we're talking about quality. So these are samples of some of the leadership roles we're talking about today. Uh, certainly from a project management standpoint, we have uh, those that manage groups of projects or, or programs. We have the project managers, uh, sometimes working for the project managers. We have schedulers, project administrators, planners coordinators, all those kinds of roles, and, and sometimes different titles, project leaders, engagement managers, they, they, they all uh, have this business controls function for the on-time, on-budget delivery. And then in the technical execution, we have development resources like technical, like programmers, uh, testers and QA, documentation, technical writers, all those kinds of things. So that's one context for today's conversation. And really, I, I point this out because we're talking about the middle layer today. Execution leadership is about delivering projects on time, on budget, on spec, and in the IT context, using these kinds of roles. If I could, if I could switch outside of IT for the moment, if we went, for example, to drug development or the pharmaceutical industry, we would start to see that same context in terms of portfolio management. How do we choose the right candidates coming out of discovery? How do we choose the right compounds? Do they have e efficacy? Are they going to be useful against certain disease types? certain therapeutic areas, so that, that, that science remains the same. How do we pick the best candidates, the best bang for the buck that are going to meet the objectives of the organization? How do we monitor those things? How do we respond to things that have gone wrong with the portfolio? When we get into the execution leadership, now we have a research and development, probably development methodology or drug development methodologies. And so to deliver these drugs as expected, or, or as the FDA would say on label, would be clinical research analysts, uh, folks that manage clinical resource organizations, study directors, medical affairs directors, and the list goes on, but this is just intended to be a sampling. On the leadership side, from an on-time, on-budget on perspective, 
still program managers and project managers, but we might call those project managers, project managers, for example, clinical trials managers. In the medical writing world, we, we might give them a, a medical writing title, uh, or medical affairs, those kinds of roles. And then, obviously, still the schedulers and project administrators, project leaders, project planners. At the scientific application level, now we start to see the people who, who, who deliver the drugs, the medical writers, the data analysts, the clinicians, the, the QA folks, the clinical research associates. So these are just intended to give backdrop and, and, and context to this discussion that we're having today about how to fill these kinds of leadership roles. So if we can talk about the challenges and impacts uh, that we run into. Uh, first, uh, you'll, you'll, see, you'll see the challenges and impacts will be presented uh, in unison. And what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through uh, a fairly large list here of uh, the challenges themselves and then drill into each of the challenges. So we have the challenge of unrealistic timelines, which is very common in any kind of a staffing environment. Uh, the, the requirements not being clear. Uh, hiring technical talent versus leadership talent, it's different. So, so it can be a challenge to, to take folks that are used to hiring technical talent and ask them to hire leadership talent. It's a different animal. Uh, the overemphasis on skills versus results. So the skills, uh, the same skill may produce different results depending on the kind of results we're looking for. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, process gaps is a challenge. So is, is there really a complete process? Is there a roadmap that's going to be followed, uh, both from the client as well as the staffing partner? Uh, treating staffing as a commodity uh, can be a challenge for some organizations. It, it happens more and more these days, and we'll talk about some of those challenges. We'll talk about the cost of commoditization. And finally, uh, the inability to meet objectives with some with a suboptimal team. Some of the challenges that happens well, if we're trying to fill leadership positions, what happens if we don't do a good job? So if I can take these one by one, we'll talk first about this unrealistic timeline. And there's an expectation out there that, you know, if we're, if we're going to get, get into a temporary staffing situation, uh, it's going to be fast. Uh, if, if we need to respond quickly, uh, the best way to do that is not to hire full-time equivalents, but, but to go into the staffing market. So, so right out of the gate, we have an expectation that oftentimes this isn't true. Uh, hiring temporary staff positions, especially in leadership roles, isn't always best. So uh, some of the unrealistic timelines uh, come with planning, uh, planning with procurement. It takes longer than expected. Procurement has a role. If we don't understand that role or we underestimate that role, that's a challenge. Uh, candidate availability with realistic onboarding dates. Uh, it's not uncommon that, uh, realistically, if, if we think today on, on July 19th that we're going to hire somebody, uh, we're hoping it's by the end of July. The reality is it may not be until the middle, middle of end of August when we talk through some of the uh, best practices here. These things take time. So it, it can be challenging to start an onboarding, uh, I'm sorry, an, an evaluation of candidates process in the middle of July if we're not going to be able to bring them in until the middle or end of August if they're already looking at other opportunities. So that's a challenge. So aligning that availability of the actual folks we're thinking about bringing in with when we can realistically get them in often leads to losing people because our, our windows are misaligned. The, uh, the other thing about quick and unrealistic timelines is the best people aren't the, best, aren't, aren't the most available ones always. Uh, it's, it's typically the case that the most, avail uh, most available people are not the best leaders. Uh, the com competition for too many other high priority initiatives. So if I'm trying to hire somebody into a leadership role, I'm probably doing some of that work myself. So if I'm the hiring manager trying to get some help, I need the person I'm trying to hire in order to make time to hire the person. It's sort of a cat, you know, it, it, it's a chicken and the egg game, right? Which came first, the, the need or, or the availability to find that person. So that's a big challenge as well. Uh, multiple inputs in the decision process. So there are oftentimes are uh, various roles on the team, various people that want to have input, various levels of approval, and, uh, and underestimating that also creates some un unrealistic timelines. And really just overall, the unrealistic understanding of the time commitment necessary to get it right. If we're trying to fill leadership positions, it does take time, and, and by rushing it, and, and, by, and by taking uh, the best available candidate today instead of the, best, instead of the optimal candidate can really lead to some challenges. The next challenge I want to talk about is the unclear requirement. So there's an expectation we need to get somebody now. And uh, in order to do that, we need to have an understanding of what we really need. Well, you know, what do we really need to bring on board? 
uh, providers, if we're sending a requirement out to providers, uh, oftentimes uh, requirements are missing the big picture context. So, so you know, especially for leadership positions, what is it that they're expected to lead? What's the overall business context? Why was this project conceived? What you know, what are the organizational objectives? Uh, what what are the goals that are out there? So, so that those those requirements essentially uh, need to reflect that big picture. Uh, oftentimes, not well documented. You know, whisper down the lane. The hiring manager talks to a recruiter. The recruiter is the one talking to the providers. There can be this is a simplified uh, picture. There can be five, six, seven different people that are from the originator of I have a need to the person who's actually looking for the for for that talent. Uh, there can be several iterations and several manglings of that communication that result in unclear requirements. Uh, the other thing that, that we've seen happen quite a bit is the requirement gets refined as we as we present candidates. So it, sometimes it's hard to know what you're looking for until you get a sampling of what's out there. People uh, come in, they ask you good questions. Those good questions ask you to uh, make you ask yourself some good questions that turn into the fine tuning of the requirements. So, so what we find out is uh, these things evolve, and uh, you know the more they evolve, the more false starts we have, and the more time it takes to, uh, to have recruiters sort of you know re reset their focus and potentially get uh, certainly happens with us. Uh, some of the folks we're talking to suddenly become uh, invalid as as an interview is conducted, and they say, well, not that because, and when we hear what that because is, it, it changes the requirement. Uh, the, the other reason they change is just through compromise. You know, it's, it's not common uh, either in the staffing world or in the permanent hiring world that if we have 10 requirements or, or 15 requirements or 15 results we're seeking, that we're going to find somebody that can do all 10 or 15 of those things. So, so now we're starting to get into this prioritization of requirements. Well, what's the most important thing? What am I willing to live without? If that talent doesn't exist in the marketplace exactly the way my organization is looking for it, what is that compromise going to be so we can align who's available with who's optimal? The next challenge is just the, this, this whole challenge of hiring technical versus leadership talent. Uh, in our experience in leadership roles, I can't think of one example. Well, first I would say I can think of examples where we were told somebody needed to be replaced. Uh, I can't think of one example when that happened, when somebody called us up and said, you know, they just don't know the job. They don't know project management. They don't know database analysis. They're, they don't know business analysis. Uh, we've heard that from candidates when they're being interviewed. But certainly, once folks hit the ground, uh, this this idea of Gibson Gall is something we focus focus on quite a bit. And, and Gibson Gall is is an, is an abbreviation for uh, good good interpersonal skills is the Gibbs, and Gall is gets along with everyone. And so, th this idea of uh, focusing on on the technical piece. Oftentimes, uh, and I don't mean to suggest that you know a business analyst shouldn't know how to do business analysis, but my point is from an from an emphasis standpoint, we, we have found that uh, organizations that have traditionally focused on technical know-how oftentimes will lose this idea of the cultural alignment. Is this person really a fit? Uh, yeah, they can do business analysis, but if they're going to get people upset on the team and they're like a bull in the china shop. Um, that in a leadership role, that, that, that challenge is, is magnified quite a bit. Um, so cultural alignment, uh, value, alignment of values, uh, when they're overlooked, that can be a problem. So, so getting inside people's heads and, and what their value systems are, what their ethical system is, or lack thereof, uh, can lead to better alignment outside of this pure technical world. So leadership talent is uh, harder to assess. Uh, Leaders operate typically in, in an environment where, where for the example here, uh, leadership is taken and not given. Well, how, how do you prove in an interview that somebody's going to take leadership? Um, or we've even heard when we say we have folks to take leadership, we've, we've gotten the pushback to say, well, well, we're not sure we can bring in outsiders and have them take leadership or have them you know, say no to an executive, which, which sometimes is maybe what a good leader needs to do. So you know this 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 whole, this whole idea of how do I how do I know if, if this is somebody who's going to make things happen? You know, some people make things happen, some people watch things happen, and some people say what happened. And and, and to figure out which category that person falls into you know, can be extremely challenging. And we'll and we'll address that in the best practices, but it, but but it's a challenge. 
The other thing is, even when we think about the technical skills, for example, of project management, there sometimes can be an overemphasis on just looking at the skills. Requirements often are laundry lists or inventories of skills. And so uh, we really need somebody who's going to be effective at getting the job done. Yeah, they're going to need some skills, but you know, this, this work history and education is part of it, but uh, especially in the leadership role, how about high initiative and self-motivation? How do we how do we measure that? Do we think high initiative and self motivation are important? I'd say probably yes in a leadership role. Uh, so how do we how do we judge that? How do we judge flawless execution? If people are going to go out there and get the job done and get it done right, and if we're looking for experience, it's because that's what we're looking for, right? We're looking to get the job done right. We're looking for flawless execution. Uh, how do we how do we judge leadership of teams? Uh, people will say they've led teams, and if we drill in far enough, we'll find out they were on the team. They might have had a leadership role in the team, but they weren't the leader of the team. They might have owned a piece of that. How do we how do we map similar success? If somebody's had success in a different environment, how does that map to my environment? So so that apples and apples comparison can be can be difficult to come across. Uh, people's adaptability. Uh, we we see this quite a bit, even with candidates coming back to us telling us they don't think they could adapt. Well, you know, if you're going into a tough situation as a leader, certainly adaptability is something we expect our leaders to have. Uh, personality and style and culture and team fit, very important, hard to judge. So, and, and, and they, get, they get particularly hard to judge when we're looking for leaders but we're not looking for these things specifically. We're worried about can they do business analysis, can they do project management, can they do clinical trials management, do they understand the drug, process, uh, drug development process, do they understand the FDA's needs, how to write a protocol, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yes, those things are important but not at the price of these things. The next challenge, uh, process gaps themselves. Uh, certainly in the, uh, in the world of best practice, the idea is that we actually have a process, that we have maybe something like a plan or a schedule. So, so are we going to spend time to help our partners get it right? If we're hiring staff and companies, what are we going to do in terms of our investment with them? Uh, providing feedback so, so that if, if requirements have changed, we're, we're not we're not sending folks on a wild goose chase. It's our time. It's our valuable time we're spending. It's their valuable time. And when we lose time, we lose opportunity. So um, trusting provider references. Um, if somebody says they've, they've checked references, is that good enough for you? Or is there something you have to do to validate that? Uh, confirming the funding. Uh, it, it wouldn't be uncommon at all for us to have a candidate selected and then have somebody say, well, we're going to go prove we got the money back. Now that we have the person uh, identified. So. Uh, you know, it's, it's typically a process gap that causes that. It's not because people want to do a bad job. Uh, it's, it's, it's that they're doing a bad job because they don't have a checklist or a procedure to follow. Um, aligning expectations among provider, procurement, and, and, and requester. I mentioned this already in terms of whispering down the lane with requirements. Certainly that applies to all the other best practices we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, staffing is a commodity. You know, it's, it's uh, I, I think... If, if you were to poll just about anybody in this world and, and say, you know, would you consider this a, um, a value purchase or a commodity, you'd probably hear commodity. And, and I want to address this because, I, I, you know, if you look at the definition of a commodity and then you look at staffing itself, it, it doesn't really fit the definition that well. You know, when there's a, there's a zero cost of replacement uh, is, 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 is one of the definitions. Um, you know what is the cost of getting it wrong versus getting it right? You know if you if you you know if you buy the wrong paper plates at the local market at the corner, it's not that hard to walk back and replace replace a pile of paper plates for your picnic you're having this weekend. But you know you think about uh, getting the wrong person, and you know are you really going to do a redo? Are you going to tell people you got it wrong? Are you going to replace that person? Are you going to go back through the interviewing process and go back to your providers and go back through procurement and canceling and reissuing a purchase order? Uh, especially in the leadership position, you know, what does that do to team morale uh, when you bring somebody in and, and, and they're not a fit? So, so uh, obviously the tone of this slide is that, you know, it's 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 really not a commodity. It doesn't act like a commodity. However, uh, you know, we understand that, that in today's world, you know, there there are certainly aspects of of uh, of bringing in technical talent that, that can act like a commodity. And, and, and But when you start taking that same mentality over to the leadership side, it becomes particularly challenging. Right? The, easy, the easy replacement mentality is, uh, is really not that applicable. So if the replacement 
cost doesn't act like a commodity is it a commodity um, and same thing same thing's true with the relationship you know it is you know are you looking for a vendor or are you looking for a partner right if it's really if it's really something you can be treated like a commodity you, you treat it like a commodity right you go uh you go on amazon and you, and, and, and you click you know uh, instead of sorting by relevance you sort price low to high they're all the same if I'm looking for a connector to Recharge my my, my uh, cellular phone, and, and they're all the same. I'll take the five dollar one over the ten dollar one, and the replacement cost is low, especially with Amazon. All you do is leave it on your doorstep, and they pick it up. So so this can be a uh, real really challenging. And as we just stay stay on this, you know, the the cost of commoditization. What are the real costs of suboptimal hires? That that's really what what we need to think about. Oftentimes we train our leaders, even if they're outsiders. We bring them into leadership meetings. We we incur. Uh, uh, fees beyond training to bring folks in, in into the team. There, there, there's often uh, travel time. There's there's other staff members that get involved in, in, in knowledge transfer. So uh, and that's just the immediate identifiable cost. What about you know the the, the indirect cost of, of a project not going well? You know there's revenue and profit. Uh, there's efficiency. There's potentially loss of customers. Right. So so the cost of a of a bad hire is 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 almost the same. As it is on the full-time equivalent. Uh, the, other, the other thing is, how about the excessive management? You know, if you're not going to replace it now, you know, there's a stat out there that I heard about two years ago that said that we, as leaders, who manage other leaders, spend 80% of our time on on 20% of the staff, and the 20% we're spending it on are the ones that are the biggest problems. Right? So we get the excessive management, the mental anguish, the frustration, the waste of time, and uh, so I, I would suggest that. Um, it's not a commodity. If you can't treat it like a commodity, it's really not a commodity. And we need to think, even in the even in the world where our procurement systems oftentimes are set up to ask us to treat it like a commodity, the reality is we need to be careful about how, how far we take that thinking. And the other challenge is what about the overall you know, objectives of the suboptimal team? Hiring the wrong leader causes the team to fail. There's a lot of stats around that. If uh, My favorite uh, cliche is the fish rots at the head first. You know, so so if, if things are going wrong, we can usually look to the leader and, and ask the question of, of, of what's going wrong here. Leader sets standards, so poor performance from a leader sets a standard of poor performance for the team, uh, and, and it's a fair reflection on, on on you as well, right? So people expect you to do something about this. If you don't, now now your now now your leadership is in question as well. Um, other people know they're not doing the job; they expect you to do something. So that's there are the challenges, and, and there there's many. I was um, I was a little bit surprised how long that list got when we really started laying some of this stuff out. Uh, the good news is there's also a, 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 a lot of best practices we can bring into play in order to uh, deal with these challenges. So this is a suggested best practice. It's not the only answer, but I'll I'll just go through it. Uh, some of these will be pretty obvious from some of the challenges. Communicating a process and defining requirements as, as a starting point. So uh, in our world, we call it an LOU or a letter of understanding. Start with the end in mind and work backwards with the schedule and the process we're going to follow. So if you need this person by the, by the third week of July or the third week of August, let's think about all those things that need to happen in order to make that happen. Let's work backwards. And you know, it's just like any other project, right? If we know what we're going to try to deliver, then we're going to need a schedule and a set of activities in order to meet that schedule. Uh, finding the best candidates, we'll talk a little bit about that, how, how, how can we do that. Uh, certainly reviewing, comparing, selecting, and following up. So, so how, how do we do that in a, uh, in a more formal fashion? Uh, we see a real significant lack of formality in this area. I'll talk about that a little bit. Preparing for the interview. Uh, we, we see just a ton of people in project-based environments where projects have been approved, leadership spots are open, the project started. We need the leadership spot started. I'm filling in. I'm the, I'm the hiring manager. I'm filling in the leadership spots, and somehow I'm supposed to be preparing for the interview, selecting the right candidates, giving timely feedback. It's pretty messy. It can be. It can be really messy. Uh, conducting the interviews. It happened in the, that happened in a timely fashion. Selecting the right candidate, and then finally uh, conducting the post decision process. So once we make a decision, there's still work to do, and we'll talk about some of those things as well. So communicating the process and defining requirements. So, so once the need is identified, we, we want to communicate 
to the team, right? It's like any it's like any other plan. If we've got a plan, let's let's build it, let's communicate it, let's make sure everybody's on the same page. You know, setting some target dates um, and and getting this information out to all the interested and involved parties that will be involved in this thing. Uh, certainly, identifying the requirement and confirming confirming that the position is approved and funded. Uh, we've seen requirements change because funding changes. You know, we, we want $150 an hour person, but the budget says 100 Well, that's going to dictate something about the requirement at some point. And uh, this idea of SOAR, uh, S-O-A-R, uh, you know, if, if we're thinking about a requirement, what is that substantial departmental goal? Can we describe the situation or problem uh, that we're trying to tackle? What are the obstacles to success that this person will encounter? We want to make sure we talk about those things. Uh, what actions will overcome the problem? So how do we implement, organize, and develop, and create uh, an approach to handling the challenges? And what results will define success? And you'll, you'll see some of this coming up in some of the later best practices. So this is just introducing the idea. Uh, we'll certainly revisit this as we go through the interviewing and selection process. I'm understanding what's really needed. Right? So the, the, this right, getting this right ratio of technical versus leadership talent, um, we, one of the things we do uh, in, in our in our solutions business is, is we uh, implement project management technology. And you know, I've got to tell you, there's some really great project managers out there that are very good at Microsoft Project. Right? So does that mean they're not a good project manager? Probably not. So, you know, but if, if what you're asking them to do is to be in the tool every day, um, that's an example of setting the right ratio. If, on the other hand, we're asking them to uh, be in a leadership role where they're going to be negotiating some tough issues with the customer. There's nebulous uh, scope. There's there's a lot of uh, angst in the business community and misalignment of, of objectives. You know that's that's a pretty different skill than knowing how to build a work breakdown structure with Microsoft Project. And I can go on several other examples with DBAs and systems analysts and clinical trials managers. But that this whole idea of you know what, what are we really trying to focus on here? Um, it's not uncommon at all. For us to get a requirement for a project manager, when we drill in, they're looking for somebody who really knows how to build a drug, or somebody who can really uh, know something about SQL Server database analysis, or SAP, or, or, or the list goes on. So define the plan and timeline for the interview and selection and hiring. This is all part of the plan. Uh, getting the internal constituents aligned, right? So, so what, are, what, are, what are the priorities here? Do we have HR, finance, and internal team members? Stakeholders. So who are these folks that need to be involved in this decision? What are their roles, and, and have they been communicated? Is that understood? Are we trying to get on their calendar? Do, do they get that they're going to have a role in this thing, and, 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 and ask them to be fair about committing to that role? And this balance of job skills versus results. Uh, you know, the laundry list of skills is nice, but focusing on results is important as well. So next thing we'll talk about is uh, finding the best candidate. So some of the obvious things, you know, is it going to be internal, is it going to be external, using internal sourcing uh, departments or, 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 or uh, roles? Is it going to be external with partners? Are we going to go out and, you know, ask, ask staffing companies to fulfill this need? Are we going to do all those things? Are we going to do them in a different order? We're going to go internal first and then use our internal sourcing and then go to our external partners. And, you know, I can tell you as an external partner, that will affect our priority on your requirements. You know, we know you already got, you know, feelers out internally for the past month and uh, with other sourcing for, for the past two weeks, and, and, and then we know, you know, we're, we're third in line. Uh, that affects our ability to invest in terms of priorities against other can other partners who maybe are coming to us first. So, so all these things matter. How we communicate that matters. Uh, communicating the requirement. And, um, um, and if necessary, we're going to hire and solicit staffing partners. Communicating the requirement, including the big picture clearly. So we talked earlier in the challenges about not giving the big picture and what that does, especially in leadership positions. Uh, we, we have certainly heard, after we had a set of requirements, some, some fine-tuning of the big picture. And, and we've seen that actually affect the candidates that we're picking to bring into an opportunity. Having that big picture really matters. Review, compare, select for follow-up. So, so if we're getting candidates in, uh, the, you know, the, the clock's ticking, right? So, so now we've got to be crisp and timely. Uh, something I said in, in, in the challenges early on was something about the best candidates aren't, aren't the most available ones. Uh, sometimes the best candidates uh, are available, and when they are, it's not going to be for long, 
right? So, so if we're crisp and timely with our scheduling, running the interview, following up, especially in front of good candidates, uh, certainly I've, I've seen uh, some of our customers lose our best candidates uh, by not being respectful to them, by not, you know, by treating them as a commodity, by, by um, uh, you know, entering email in the interview, by uh, talking to people for five minutes. And, and you know, we, we've had some candidates come back to us and say, you know, I, I think I liked it, but I didn't learn much. And uh, I'm looking at three other opportunities, and I, and I found out some really cool things about the other opportunities. And I got to tell you, without knowing much about this one, I, I, I can't really put my bet there. So, um, you know, we we are in the people business, and, and we certainly recognize that the best people are not commodities. They are hard to replace, they're hard to come by, and they're very impactful when you get them. Uh, the skills versus asset matrix. We'll talk about this uh, a couple times in, uh, in the next couple slides. But this idea of, you know, uh, what, what are the results that we're looking for versus the skills? How are we going to score it objectively? How do we compare uh, candidates to one another? So this, you know, this idea of uh, like an Excel spreadsheet to provide an objective means for doing the skills versus results matrix uh, can be pretty powerful and pretty helpful for running this kind of a process. Preparing for the candidate interview. So if we get the uh, results from the skills versus results matrix, we can determine uh, where we want to focus our time. Uh, usually we can't cover all 15 areas in an interview. So uh, uh, the third bullet, assigning roles for all involved parties. We may have different people focusing in different areas. Uh, we want to use a structured assessment tool to collect feedback. So if different people are talking to the same person, there's a way to assimilate that feedback and bring it together and get a complete picture. So divide and conquer and then bring it back together. Uh, setting the stage before asking questions. So if, if, if we do happen to have that diamond in the rough, that, that great leader who happens to be available, and I may be lucky enough to get that person on my team, uh, we're selling a little bit. We ought to be. Right? The best people uh, want to hear that it's a good place to go. So discuss the, you know, what, the kind of things that are exciting about the job, what the critical success factors are, um, what, what their role is in future vision. If they're leaders, they're going to want to know that. Uh, leaders want to lead, so they're going to lead from, from, from some uh, shining beacon out on the horizon that they can point to. And then a the success-based interview. Uh, success-based meaning that we're going to look at what's going to make that person successful, right? That high motivation, that, that ability to lead. So uh, we want to get some core questions that we make sure we cover. Uh, focus on that self-motivation and governance of success. You know, really, really uh, get into it. And, and the way we get into that is through examples. Give me an example of when you've done that. Actually conducting the interview. Um, so I, I, it's interesting. People, uh, leaders, say they lead. So if you're looking at a resume, you're going to see led, led this and led that and you know instrumental in and all those wonderful uh, thesaurus of terms we see from leaders in, in resumes. So what we really want to do is we want to drill into this thing. You know, we, we want to take a magnifying glass to it, and then we want to take a microscope to it. What was your role? What was your exact role? How many times have you been in this role, just on this job or others? Uh, define what the candidate needs to be good at and explore, the, explore those things in the interview. Take those top three or four and, and, and go deep. Uh, force yourself to postpone biases. I, I, you know, first impressions can be very, very hard to get past. Uh, so it's, it's hard to stay objective. Uh, I prefer a phone screen fired, fired to a face-to-face, -face, not only because it's time consuming, but uh, I do get biases, both positive and negative, uh, in a face-to-face -face situation. I have found that I can learn to like somebody in a phone interview that had I met them first, I might not have been able to put some of those biases aside. Uh, I always like them more or less in a face-to-face. -face. So, so it's, it's always interesting to sort of take that, take that, uh, those impressions in degrees if, if possible. I'll use the interview to evaluate the five best predictions of long-term success. So I talked about this in the challenge side in terms of uh, uh, building requirements. So we, you know, we want to, if, if we're bringing leaders in, I hope we're looking for high initiative, flawless execution, uh, actual leadership itself, past successes, adaptability to your environment. All, all these things are going to define success for a leader. And uh, listen deeply and be respectful. Uh, hard to do, easy, easy to drift off, easy to think about what your next question is. Uh, I very much have a hard time taking notes and listening to what somebody's saying at the same time. So. Uh, sometimes you just gotta listen if you, if you really want to. If you really want to see what this person's saying, 
selected the right candidate. So, so hopefully, if, if we've done this well, we've got some data. You know, we've got some, some hopefully objective uh, sort of matrix of the feedback, uh, either from you uh, yourself or from you and others who may have participated. So, how do we, so, so hopefully we can be objective. Uh, we can not operate from memory. We've got a good set of notes. We've got a good set of uh, uh, spreadsheets. We, we can we can normalize and compare to one another. Uh, you know, obviously this idea of uh, good interpersonal skills, getting along with others uh, over technical skills, being a, a key determinant of what you're really looking for. Uh, coordination among all parties, not just the interviewers, but uh, the, the other the other parts of your organization that will need to be involved in this process. Reviewing and selecting candidates provided by the staffing partner, so you know, providing feedback and, uh, and getting the right folks. We may have to ask questions. We may have to interact to see if they're the right people. We may have some follow-ups. Uh, some of these are just a little bit deeper from what I had on the previous page. So uh, the ratings that you would have on uh, in your matrix, you want to rate. Uh, I'm not going to read them off to you. You have you have eight bullets here. Um, the slides will be available. Uh, in, in the end, we'll have a um, uh, we'll have a recording of this posted on our website probably by tomorrow. So uh, you can always refer back to some of this this stuff if you need it. Include data gathered from standard interview questions, obviously. Um, substantive feedback. Where did we go deep? Where did we put that magnifying glass and, and that microscope? Um, uh, documenting any key areas of concern. Uh, I always hate it when I see something I don't like in an interview because if I like somebody and I see something I don't like, uh, it's it's you know you don't get too many chances to see what somebody's really like. And when you see something bad in an interview, it's probably not something that's just going to go away. You know, so if we have an area of concern, unfortunately, you know that's that's something we're we're going to have to deal with. We're going to have to question it, and we're going to have to really be careful about selecting somebody that has uh, has any red flags the way in the interview process. Uh, valid, validate through reference checks. Um, our providers may be telling us that they've done reference checks. We want to do some validation on that. And obviously from subordinates, peers, bosses, customers. Our, our biggest one is bosses. I'm surprised how many people will give you previous managers. We have a tendency to think that uh, they're off limits. You know, they, they don't want us to call their past job. Uh, people will find a way to get you to their bosses if they want the job. And uh, the bosses, I think, have some of the best feedback you can get. And uh, providing feedback. Um, We've, we've certainly invested our valuable time collecting candidates, sending them in, uh, screening them, getting people excited, and, uh, and don't get feedback. Now, if you don't like my candidate, tell me, please. That would be really nice. Um, and, and it'll make me want to invest in your opportunities next time. So this is the idea. Of, you know, we understand this. You know, we're, if we're viewed as a commodity, we're going to be treated like a commodity. But if you want a partner, uh, treat them like a partner, and you'll get the same results that you would get from a partner. The post-decision process, we're close to the end here. You may be sensing with um, 13 minutes before 4, if you're on the East Coast. Uh, conducting the post-decision process. So this whole idea of, uh, you know, okay, we, we think we got the person that we want. How do we get them uh, procure, through procurement? How do we get them oriented? How do we get them on board and uh, not lose them once we've got them on the line? So if we've got the right person, let's, let, let's get it right and, and really get them to show up on the job. Get them productive quickly, the badging, the technology, the standard operating procedures, all those things are important. And uh, reviewing all best practice process steps. So if we had a process up front, if we had a plan, uh, we probably want to check it to make sure we followed it. Did we miss anything? Is there anything critical in the process? Did we do something that wasn't in our process that needed to be added? Did we learn something? So ensure all the steps have been completely communicated. And uh, if there's new steps, it's an area of improvement. Let's get them documented. Let's get them into the process for next time. So in terms of next steps, uh, just just a moment uh, on project assistance. I mentioned our solutions business and our staffing business. We we're a consulting firm that provides innovative solutions to uh, that really helps flawless execution. So you talk about flawless execution of people. We're, our our, our uh, deal is flawless execution of key initiatives, right? Organizational strategy, typically in a project intensive environment. So it won't surprise you to know that we do things around projects. Uh, it's our job to work with our customers and our partners to reduce their risk. It's our, our job to maximize uh, your return on investment, speed your realization of business value, and drive effective organizational change. So our, all of our offerings and methodologies support that mission. So our practices are our, uh, I mentioned our solution business, project and portfolio management services, things like implementing project technology, Microsoft Project, for example, collaboration services, including SharePoint. 
Uh, we deliver training on project management as well as uh, tools and technology, uh, portfolio management, application development, typically in one of these areas you see above. Uh, project management outsourcing, which includes staffing. Uh, the Platinum Staffing Service. We, uh, platinum Staffing is another way we, we refer to the non-technical ex leadership execution skills that I used back on uh, the third and fourth slide of our presentation today. And uh, Project Commander, which is uh, add-on technology for Microsoft Project Scheduling Tool. So next steps. Uh, certainly if you're interested in the solution side of our business, we have an offering for that. We have a, uh, a complimentary uh, maturity improvement and readiness briefing we can do. Sometimes people in staffing environments, leadership roles fail because the project management infrastructure is so bad. If that describes you, you might be interested in slide 36 here. Uh, I have Jan's contact information. Certainly uh, uh, you can get to me if you want to as well. Uh, Jan's email and phone number is here. Our website is here. And I mentioned uh, our upcoming webinars. You'll see that on our events page as well as some of the historical ones we've been doing for several years. There's many of them out there by year. And uh, you can go out and find those as well. And so that brings us to the question and answer portion of our presentation today. And I'm going to turn it back over to Jen. OK, Gus, we have already received a few questions. So um, why don't we get started with these? OK, and if, you, and if you all have questions while I'm answering these first couple of, I can't see the questions, but when, when you're done <laughs> reading the ones we have, uh, feel, feel free to add to that if anybody has any follow-up questions. OK, I'm just going to start with the first one. What suggestions do we have when procurement mandates a staffing process that treats leadership acquisition as a commodity? Uh, what options, suggestions do we have? What suggestions do we have when procurement mandates a staffing process that treats leadership acquisition? Yeah, usually if procurement is uh, mandating a staffing process that feels like Commodity. The question is, what are they commoditizing? Right. Usually, the pricing is somewhat commoditized. Um, that's probably not one you're going to get a lot of uh, help with uh, from from procurement. I mean, you get what you pay for at the end of the day. So, uh, certainly, the uh, consolidation of of, uh, of suppliers is intended to uh, uh, force competition and 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 uh, drive the prices down. But I think. You know, a lot of what we talked about today wasn't necessarily price related, right? The things we can do uh, when procurement has a commoditized process is we can still, uh, you know, treat partners as as, as value add in a lot of cases. There may be uh, sometimes there's communication barriers to partners. Uh, oftentimes they can be worked with. Uh, oftentimes you're encouraged actually to communicate with partners. So I, I think the biggest thing we can do is is not is not fall victim. Uh, to that mentality, you know, if if we take our time and we look for the right people, we have a much better chance of getting the right people. Um, the other thing that we sometimes see is uh, treating an acquisition of leadership talent as a statement of work. You know, so if, if we're going to be, uh, uh, if you know, staffing's been commoditized, it's probably something you're purchasing by the hour. Um, if we can demonstrate that, um, if for example, we're going to have a clinical. Uh, uh, data analysts come in and, and one of their jobs is, is to build a protocol for a clinical trial. Uh, we could maybe put an RFP out there for somebody who's going to deliver uh, a protocol. Uh, and, and, and we're going to put some specific tasks around that, some intermediate deliverables. And oftentimes there's an alternative procurement process to make that happen. Um, there are sole source justifications. I mean, we've certainly been involved in that. We're a, a highly specialized kind of, of staff acquisition. So if you come to us and ask us for um, C Sharp and .NET developers, we can certainly do that, but we don't lead with that. So we, we've been in, we've been in a position with several large companies where procurement says, okay, if it's you know if it's highly specialized uh, pharmaceutical project management that you're looking for, uh, we'll let you go outside the, uh, of the mainstream if, if you can justify why why you need somebody who has specific skills in this area. So uh, hopefully that answers the question. If not, uh, feel free to send a follow up, and we we can uh, talk to you directly. Gus, I have another question for you. Do we have any recruiting technology um, that we use or recommend to support this process? Yes, we do. Um, we we started when we the first time we started formalizing this process, we started with SharePoint, um, and SharePoint uh, Microsoft uh, has templates for. 
uh, various applications. One of the templates they have is for uh, actually uh, talent management, recruiting uh, database, you know, putting, putting folks out there. Uh, we did that for a long time, and, and that worked well for us. Most recently, we've taken on uh, and augmented that, that base of information, that technology base, that tool base, with a uh, software as a service. Uh, it happens to be called Taleo, T-A-L-E-O. Uh, we came across a white paper from Gartner that uh, compared uh, the, magic, the typical magic quadrant from Gartner. You know, the, complete, the upper right-hand corner is uh, high completeness of vision and high ability to execute. Taleo scored pretty high. They also were cost effective uh, for our organization. And uh, it's, it's been a good thing for us. I mean, we, we, uh, we certainly, uh, we have a, a fairly large virtual bench, so it's not uncommon for us to say, okay, you know, we, we, we know 25 or 35 or 55, depending on what the requirement is, people who do this kind of thing, how can we zero in quickly? So there certainly is technology out there that can help do that. Um, if, you look at, if you look at the state of the art today with technology, um, they do a lot. I mean, when we entered the market uh, to look for this kind of talent, we thought we were trying to manage a resume database. What we found out was many, many other parts of our process were streamlined and automated. How you post requirements on your website, how you collect resumes, um, how, how you follow the entire process from beginning to end, basically. So uh, emphatically, yes, there is some great recruiting technology out there, and it's not intended for project assistance and people who are providers. It, it works with people who are internal as well to, uh, to, to manage their talent acquisition. So some pretty good stuff out there, and uh, I was pretty amazed to see what, what existed when we first uh, went in, into the marketplace. Jan's giving me the we don't have any more questions signal. So. Uh, so I'll give four minutes back on your day. I, I want to, again, thank you all for your time and attention. And uh, the Jan will post the recording probably within the next 24 hours. And uh, please don't hesitate to let us know if there's anything we can do to help in this area. Thanks again for your time.